Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. They offer free checking with industry-leading mobile banking. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. What's going on, Hokie Nation? Welcome into this week's edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast. Boy, do we got a good show for you. We just had Andy Bitter sit down and talk to former Virginia Tech defensive coordinator Phil Omation. We got a ton of football recruiting stuff to go over for both this upcoming class in 2023 and the 2024 class in the future. And Big, big news in the world of college basketball scheduling, and it has a lot to do with both Virginia Tech men's and women's basketball. That's all coming up and more right here on episode 299 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, which starts right now. We record on Wednesday, June 7th, 2023, from our high-tech studio at the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center right here in Blacksburg, Virginia. We welcome you on, whether you are listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you consume your podcasts, or if you're watching on YouTube. If you are on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe while you're there, and also turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any future TSL content. Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. First Bank and Trust Company is the bank that puts you first. Visit www.firstbank.com to learn more. And we're also pleased to welcome a brand new sponsor to Tech Sideline and to the podcast. Alumni Hall in Blacksburg. Located in the First and Main Shopping Center, Alumni Hall has the best selection of Virginia Tech apparel, accessories, and gifts. Now through June 18th, Alumni Hall is offering 20% off both online and in-store purchases for Father's Day using the code VTDAD23. That's VTDAD23. So look for their ads on Tech Sideline's website and on social media. All right, let's go ahead and introduce the crew so far today. We got lead analyst and columnist to my right, Chris Coleman, across the way, senior staff writer Andy Bitter, behind the scenes producing this afternoon, founder and general manager Will Stewart, and in the fourth chair today, making her debut for the first time here at Tech Sideline, Miss Kendall Williams. I'm your host, Giovanni Heater, and uh, first let's go ahead and chat over there in the fourth chair with Kendall. Kendall, want to give everyone a little bit of a background on you how you ended up here and everything like that. You're a former Virginia Tech women's lacrosse player. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and, and start there? Why Virginia Tech in the first place? And, uh, you know, break down your lacrosse career a little bit. Yeah, so thanks for having me on, guys. I'm so excited to be here. I was recruited in high school to play lacrosse at Virginia Tech. Um, I was here on the team my freshman and sophomore year, just wrapped up my sophomore year. Um, but I ultimately decided to step away and kind of pursue some other things. Um, I had such a great experience being an athlete at Virginia Tech. Uh, there's not a lot of things I could say that... Um, you know, I'm just so grateful that I walked away with all the lessons, all the people I've met. Um, but I think it was time for me to just kind of move on and get into other things. Um, yeah, I knew Virginia Tech was the place for me. I'm originally from North Carolina, and so I wanted to be somewhere super close. Um, I am definitely a homebody, but um, it's been a great experience being up here in Blacksburg. And yeah, I'm excited that I'm here. Well, like you mentioned, you're a sophomore in the sports media and analytics program, a good friend of a lot of us here on the show, Kyle Carter, myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what made you get into sports broadcasting in the first place and kind of, you know, turn that page uh, to the next chapter in your life? Yeah. So like I said, um, I'm originally from North Carolina, but I was born and I guess raised a little bit in Baltimore, Maryland. So I moved to my family moved to Charlotte going into middle school. So I've almost lived half my life in each. Um, I was being from Baltimore, a huge Ravens fan, and I would watch all these NFL games like every Sunday. My dad got like the direct TV ticket. I was always watching football, memorizing all these different things. Um, and I remember watching, obviously, through doing all that, I would watch the games and see people like Aaron Andrews, Michelle Tafoya, Pam Oliver. And I turned to my parents at the time. I was like, I really want to do that. I think I could totally be good at it. So um, I think my dream job has kind of always been to 
be a sideline reporter in the NFL. That's the ultimate goal. But um, obviously being here at Tech, getting introduced to UGO. And like we said, Kyle, Carter, all those guys um, made really great connections there, gotten involved in 3304 sports. Give them a little shout out. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been a great time. I've had such an awesome time just learning the ropes. Again, I kind of got involved this past spring, but now that I won't be, be playing lacrosse, obviously being a D1 athlete, that takes up a lot of your time. So I'm excited to put a lot more time and energy into TSL and 3304 and um, any opportunities that come my way. So Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to it. Welcome. Um, and you. let's let's get into our content for the day, guys. First and foremost, good way to start. Congratulations to uh, Michael Vick. He is on the College Football Hall of Fame ballot. Among some pretty big names, Larry Fitzgerald, Terrell Suggs, Marshawn Lynch, Marvin Harrison, Julius Peppers, and even Ryan Leaf was a big college football player. So congrats to Mike Vick. Some of those names on there you hear and you're like, those guys aren't already in the College Football Hall of Fame. Right. Like, how right. is Marvin Harrison not in the College Football Hall of Fame? Right. right. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm showing my age, but I remember watching him play in Lane Stadium, you, you know, in 1995 and things like that. Um, uh, I'd also want to throw in to back up a little bit. I got this hat from Alumni Hall. Okay. All the Virginia Tech gear that I wear on the show. Always I've gotten from Alumni Hall, even when our sponsors were uh, not Alumni Hall. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a great it's a great place as far as uh, merchandise goes. So I thought I'd uh, throw that out there. Awesome. Yeah. I, you look at that list and you go, how are these guys not in already? And uh, they have such weird qualifications. You have to be a first team All-American at some point by one of the five selectors. It seems sort of disqualifying for certain guys. Like, I right. guess that's a good starting point, but, like, you think of the quarterback position and how crowded that can be yeah. uh, to be a first-team All-American guy uh, year to year. Uh, it seems sort of disqualifying sometimes of maybe some good candidates, but the Hall of Fame is like that. With coaches, they have this rule that you have to win, like, 60% of your games or something like that. So somebody like Howard Schnellenberger would not <laughs> be eligible for it. Even though he's clearly a Hall of Fame guy, he can't be eligible. So... Uh, some weird qualifications things, but, uh, you know, rightfully so, Michael Vick on that list. And, you know, I don't know how the voting will go on that, but I think eventually at some point he will get in. Awesome. All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk a little bit of football recruiting, something that, uh, you know, there are kind of a niche group of uh, of our fans that follow recruiting uh, pretty heavily. So we'll start ahead uh, with Clayton Frady, an offensive line commit from Gardner-Webb. He'll be a big addition this upcoming season. To give you a little bit of background on him, the addition bumped Virginia Tech up from uh, the 40th spot in overall recruiting in this upcoming class to 38, so two spots. Um, he's the first offensive line uh, offensive line commitment out of the portal this year for Virginia Tech. A three-year uh, starter at Gardner-Webb started each of the 27 games that he played over there. Uh, safe to say with Silas Janzi's departure, Tech was kind of desperate for a tackle. I know, Chris, you've kind of elaborated on that before on the show. Uh, only had one guy with substantial snaps at OT on the roster up to this point before adding Frady. Uh, so my question to you guys is, what does Clayton Frady bring to the table uh, for this team? He'll walk right into the team and as the most experienced lineman on the team, <clears throat> over 1,900 career snaps, which is more than anybody else on the roster. And I know people will say, yeah, but they all came against FCS teams. That's not true because Gardner-Webb has actually challenged themselves. The last two years, they've played five FBS teams. So Frady has actually played over 300 snaps against FBS competitions, uh, like you know Marshall, Georgia Southern, teams like that. Not a Power 5 team, but uh, he brings versatility in that he started a lot of games at right tackle, but he's also started some at right guard. And Brent Pry is basically on the record saying, we don't know who our right guard's going to be. That's basically what he said. Uh, you know, there's a competition there between uh, Jesse Hansen and Bob Schick. Nobody's been able to lock it down. I don't think they're 100% happy with either guy. They could play for 80 there. They could elect to play him at tackle and then, you know, move one of the tackles in, in, inside. Uh, a guy like a Xavier Chaplin or, or a Brody Meadows. The problem with, like, moving Chaplin would be like, I don't think Frady or Meadows is a left tackle. And you don't want to move Clements to left tackle. If you do, you want to do it in the spring because you have to reverse your technique going from the right side to the left side. Like everything's the opposite with your footwork and your hand placement and everything like that. So I don't think it would be ideal to move uh, Xavier Chaplin to, to the inside. But it, it gives Virginia Tech more options. It gives them more versatility up front. Uh, it gives them more experience. And then, 
you know, FCS guys, uh, I know some people wonder, oh, why are we taking FCS guys? But, like, look how much better Duke got offensively last year when they took three transfer portal offensive linemen, one of which came from Cornell. Their starting center came from Cornell last year. I mean, there, there were three FCS linemen drafted in the NFL draft uh, this past year. Uh, so I, I think it's something that at the very least is going to provide quality too, dip, too deep depth and it'll allow the coaches to be a little more flexible with, with how they use their players at what position. Yeah, I think they just needed an, another body and more than anything else. I mean, they come out of spring, I think they felt good about four guys, Chaplin, Clements, and the Moore brothers. You need more than four to start on an offensive <laughs> line. So they're searching for that other spot, and, you know, Schick and, and Jesse Hansen had, part, uh, you know, battled for that right guard spot. But now they have another guy that you can put in the game and probably feel comfortable with rather than having to force the issue with a younger guy like Brody Meadows or Johnny Garrett or Johnny Dixon, guys that are maybe – you know, the redshirt freshmen haven't played an actual game yet. You don't know what you're going to get out of them. I think you sort of have an idea of what you're going to get with Frady. Maybe not at this level, but you've seen him on a football field before, and that's got to be comforting as a coach. So I, I don't really know how it's going to all shake out. Uh, you say you don't know if those guys can play left tackle. We don't know if Chaplin can play left tackle yet. I mean, <laughs> sure. they're like 12 snaps in the Liberty game. Uh, you know, we'll see how that whole thing goes, but at least you have some options if it doesn't work out. You go, well, you know, sometimes a guy can surprise you. Uh, you know, Kyle Chung was somebody that I'm like, this guy's going to play. And all of a sudden he's a two-year starter and he's playing right tackle. And he's a, 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 just like, okay, I didn't ever think that he could play there. From center to right tackle. Yeah, sometimes so, yeah. These, these guys surprise you when they get put in opportunities like that. So, you know, I think Crook will mix and match and he'll move guys around and try to find the best guy there. But uh, I, I think they feel better about having a starting five at this point than they did, you know, a couple of days ago. Kind of a double-edged question for you guys here. Um, first and foremost, are you surprised that they only went after one offensive lineman uh, in the portal, given the kind of lack of depth, arguably, at that position? And then the other side of that question, nine portal guys in total uh, now for this upcoming class. Getting to that point, getting towards actual summertime, fall ball doesn't start till, what, August, but are they done? Is this it? Are they going to keep adding? Not surprised they only got went after one or only one guy was a take because they're up against the scholarship limit now. He's their 84th guy. Their 85th would have been Josh Wallace, the transfer corner from UMass, but he committed to Michigan instead after he took an official visit over the weekend. So Tech was very, very close to being right at the 85-man scholarship limit going into the summer, which is actually a rare that a team is like exactly at 85. Mm -hmm. Generally, you're a, maybe probably a couple spots lower than that. So um, I, it's not surprising. I mean, Tech has... Tech has bodies on the offensive line. Like they've got, but they don't have, they have very few proven bodies. And, you know, if they could find another offensive lineman somehow this summer, I would like that very much, but it's June 7th. Like there's not any guys out there. Um, maybe somebody hits the portal right after practice starts in, in August at some one of these schools. But at that point, you would get him in so late at the process, yeah. how much could he really help you at that point? So I think what you see is, is what you get with regards to this, this coming year's roster. Yeah, I think they probably keep it open for now and wait for the right guy possibly that comes open. It doesn't even have to be an offensive lineman. It could be you know, defensive tackle, you know, that they've mentioned after this year, they have a couple guys moving out of the program and then a gap before you get to the next group. So they, they need to fill that. If they could find a guy that has two years of eligibility left, I think they'd, they'd jump at that opportunity, but it'd have to be somebody that's good enough that could develop over time. Uh, you know, I think another defensive back, you know, you mentioned Josh Wallace uh, going to Michigan. I think they would have liked to have had him probably still looking for somebody that could be sort of a versatile defensive back that could add some depth there. So, uh, you know, they don't have to fill it. You know, they can just wait and use it on a high school player or, you know, use it uh, on a scholarship within the program. You know, they like to do that a lot with walk-ons. They're seniors, and then it comes open the next year uh, as well. But I, I don't think just because they haven't filled it yet doesn't mean they have to rush into it and do it right now. I think they can be patient with that if they want to. I found this really interesting. 41% uh, of this year's scholarship football players are new to the program. Mm -hmm. um, so Brent Pry has flipped darn near half of the roster uh, coming into this upcoming season. What do you think that says about, you know, what he's doing and the future trajectory of this program, if anything, at this point? 
I think it says they went three and eight last year. <laughs> I mean, Fair. Yeah. You, this is a win or, or lose business, and you have to win if you're a head coach. If you look at the roster and you go, we're three and eight, I got to do something about this roster. And, you know, they came in and they sort of took stock of it and they get it down to the number last year, but they didn't really go in there and, you, you know, hack away more pieces at it. I think they did that this year and they created some spot. They brought in a, a bunch of transfers to fill those guys they think can contribute more on this team. And I think that's what you have to do. If you're a bad team is you got to flip the roster and turn around and get your guys in here. So that number doesn't surprise me too much because, you know, this program hit a 30 year low last year. And if that's the case, you got to bring in some fresh faces. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, and ultimately, ultimately, if you look at the names who left, off the top of my head, only two of them disappoint me. One of them's Caleb Smith, but Virginia Tech still, they brought in three wide receivers in the portal. So they have actually upgraded that position despite losing Smith. And, and, and Smith gonna play retired now. from football yeah. anyway. And then the other one that disappointed me was Kyrie Moyston, who I thought, you know, showed us some flashes in the Liberty game last year when he played. He also made the best play out of any individual defensive end that I saw the entire spring and what limited access we were allowed. And he had really changed his body. Uh, like he was a guy who, when he committed to Tech as a, going into his senior year of high school, was really skinny, only about 210 pounds. You know, he put on 30 pounds pretty quickly, which shows that he's a really hard worker in the weight room and takes his nutrition seriously and things like that. And I thought he was making some progress. Uh, quite frankly, he's bigger than the JUCO defensive end that they're bringing, at, bringing in, and he's got more years of eligibility. Um, so, and he's good, he's going to Cincinnati. Like, it's not like he's transferring down. Yeah, he went somewhere that he's, usually you see somebody go somewhere else for, like, playing right, time right. reasons or they couldn't hack it here. It feels like he could have. If he's yes. going to Cincinnati, he's going to continue to play at a Power 5 conference. Exactly. So I was disappointed to lose him. Um, but other than that, I feel like, you know, and I, and I think, you know, Christian Moss is a guy who could have helped at some point. But for the most part, you know, I feel like, they either upgrade or they upgraded or they gave themselves a chance to, to upgrade. I, I think, you know, th there needed to be some turnover. All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk a little bit of future recruiting here. I uh, just had a commit uh, for the 2024 class. Quentin Reddish, seventh commit overall in the 2024 freshman class for Virginia Tech, a three-star defensive back. He's lifted, listed as a safety, played at Independence in Charlotte, North Carolina, number 31 player in North Carolina, number 92 safety in the 2024 class overall, according to 247 Sports, chose to play at Virginia Tech over his final list was a little bit slimmer. It was more like Appalachian State, Duke, but he chose uh, over scholarship offers from NC State, Wake Forest, Miami, Missouri, West Virginia, UVA, and Duke. Uh, Pearson Prelude was his head recruiter. Didn't originally intend on committing this early, but stated that he said he was kind of blown away uh, by his visit a couple of weeks ago. Mose Phillips hosted him on his visit. Uh, so what are you guys seeing out of him? And uh, as the seventh piece of this 2024 class um you know we'll talk about after how this is kind of starting to shape up a uh, big frame 6'3, 185 could play either safety position uh if the 6'3 three is legit and he put on enough, enough weight he could also play that uh the sam linebacker position potentially i mean he's got that type of frame but right now you view him as a safety he says they're telling him field safety probably right now um Comes from Independence High School, which is a major high school in Charlotte. It's always produced players, even back to like the Leaks. I, I think the, the they went to, or at least one of them went to Independence. Chris Leak, yeah, yeah. Chris Leak went to, went to, went to Independence. Um, so that's been a long time ago, man. <laughs> um, but uh, I said Brent Pryor likes recruiting those major high schools because he knows uh, players there are held to a higher standard. Uh, I think so. Yeah, seems like a good pickup. Uh, Virginia Tech will continue to. To recruit the Charlotte area, Kendall, you're from Charlotte. So, how far of a drive is it from where you live to to Blacksburg? I'm South Charlotte, mm -hmm. so a little closer to three hours. Mm -hmm. um, but where Independence is, I know exactly where it is. That's mm -hmm. probably about two and a half. Mm -hmm. I guess it all kind of depends on how you're driving, but. Yeah, it is really close. That's why I've had people kind of be like, "So how far is it for you to drive to school?" And I'm like, "Oh, it's like two and a half, three hours." Like, really? Like that's it? I'm like, Southwest Virginia, right, in North Carolina. So you're you're driving about North Carolina for two hours and. Then Virginia for about an hour. So it's a nice, easy drive. There are large, large portions of Virginia that are further away mm -hmm. from Virginia Tech than Charlotte is. For sure. Like even like North Charlotte is slightly closer to Virginia Tech than Richmond. 
Yes. So um, I, I would say that that's going to continue to be an area for Virginia Tech, the the, the I-77 corridor, I, I guess, you know, from uh, the Virginia border through Winston-Salem all the way down to, to Charlotte. That's going to continue to be an important area for Virginia Tech because it fits in their uh, their geographic focus. That was a real focus of Fuente when yeah, he first started here. And it was, uh, you know, Dax Hollyfield, Trey Turner, Hendon Hooker, all those guys uh, coming from that area. And then Mac Brown got there and he's kind of shut off for a couple of years. And, you know, maybe, you know, Mac's getting out there. Perhaps the uh, the <laughs> opportunity is uh, uh, available there to, to kind of get back into the Charlotte area and do it. But, I mean, you're right. That makes so much sense just geographically. Uh, as somebody who drives to Richmond all the time, <laughs> my in-laws are up there. Uh, it is easier to get to Charlotte from here. Uh, just a quick drive up to 77, depending on what the fog is like on 77 <laughs> right. around fa- around Fancy Gap usually is where Fancy Gap. Uh, I love Fancy Gap. You could say the worse. same thing. Uh, you could say the same thing when you're dr- before you get to Charlottesville on uh, was it 64? Oh, going over the, the mountain right there, the after the mountain. mountain. Yeah, I you would take that thing. over driving through the fog would around really? Fancy okay. Gap all the time. But uh, it, it like I said, it's just really easy to get there. It's really close, and you know if you can take advantage of uh, the situation there. I mean, even though it's not, you know, I know they say in state is the big focus, and you know, recruit the Commonwealth. It's like, well, you got to go outside those borders too, and that's you know within that six hour radius that they like to tout so much. Well, it's a good time to tell everybody that this show today brought to you by the Hokey Way as well. At the Hokey Way, we stand behind our community and the talented Virginia Tech student athletes within it. Through charitable donations to the Hokey Way, collegiate athletes can become a voice for the charitable organizations that surround us. Learn more about how to get involved at thehokeyway.org. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about there's some big visits that are taking place uh, coming up this week. All throughout the past couple of weeks, that's kind of that time of year. Uh, Multiple four stars expected on June 9th, which is this Friday. That was kind of a headline that popped out to me. Uh, This past week, one of the more notable names that visited was Keenan Jackson out of Weddington High School in North Carolina, one of the top wide receiver targets for Virginia Tech. He actually went to the same exact high school as Kendall. So I'm going to toss it over to her for some insight on Keenan. I know you uh, bumped into him last week. I did. So um, funny enough, I was actually home this past weekend and um, high school is your own school. So I swung by Weddington, um, my alma mater high school, and just kind of visited some teachers, some coaches. Um, and I was in the football coach's office and Keenan walked in and uh, Andy Capone, head coach at Weddington High School, um, he was like, hey, Kendall, like, this is Keenan. He's he's going to be up at Virginia Tech on his official this weekend. And so I was like, oh, my gosh, no way. And he was like, you know, he's kind of playing it subtle, like, yeah, yeah, we'll see how it goes and everything. And I kind of sat there and tried to sell it to him. I was like, hey, Blacksburg, best place ever. <laughs> so hopefully between uh, my convincing and his visit this weekend, um, that pans out well. Um, but, yeah, so such a coincidence when you guys had said that was going to be something we were talking about today. I was like, wait a second. I literally just talked to him on Friday before he came. So I'm hoping it went well. Well, Weddington has had some major success on the football field in, in recent history. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? And, you know, possible, you know, you don't want to say pipeline, but that relationship with the Charlotte area in particular. For sure, for sure. Um, so I think when I was in high school, I graduated in 2021 from high school. I think between 2019, the graduates of 2019 and 2022, we had over 20 kids go to play at a Division One school for football. Um, some bigger names and some not as big schools, but still, I mean, to have 20 kids go D1. And um, I named a couple, NC State, Wake Forest, Clemson, Will Shipley, running back at uh, Clemson, went to Weddington, wow. Georgia Tech, Illinois, wow. Air Force, Princeton, Richmond, Furman, Dayton, list goes on. Um, so yeah, pretty impressive spread. They were three time, we were three time state champions within that year too. So definitely just a sort of a dynasty. And I think we all kind of left and we were like, oh, okay, like this looks like it's going to kind of be a dip of talent, but these guys have been so impressive, obviously to have Keenan, I know he's looking at Virginia Tech and a bunch of other ACC schools too. So, and he's just one of those kids. I know we've had some other guys looking at big uh, power five schools. So obviously uh, really awesome that they're keeping that up there. Um, it was funny. I actually, I interviewed coach Pry a couple weeks ago for a project and he met me and he was like, well, where are you from? And I said, Charlotte. And he's like, well, what high school did you go to? And I said, Weddington. He's like, no way. Like we've been recruiting out of Weddington a lot recently. So I was really happy to hear that. Uh, that was a, that was a hot target that they were still looking at. Um, but yeah, no, definitely a great spread at Weddington. And I'm really happy for, 
coach Andy Capone. I'll give him a shout out down there. He's worked really hard um, to help those kids kind of reach their dreams. So definitely still great to see that uh, they're having all that success down there. Sticking to the North Carolina topic, uh, Derek Jones would probably recruit that area for Virginia Tech. And I was reading an article actually, I guess it was this past winter, early spring in The Athletic, where it interviewed a bunch of anonymous high school coaches in the ACC footprint, including some in North Carolina. And one of the questions was, who's the best recruiter that comes through your school? And one of the, one of the coaches said straight up, he said, Derek Jones is as good as any recruiter that comes through my school wow. every year. So uh, Virginia Tech has a very highly regarded recruiter uh, in that area of the, of the state. So is the Mac Brown effect w- w- wears <laughs> off, you know, because he's lost his best recruiter. He's lost his offensive coordinator. It's clear he's missed his window at North Carolina as far as achieving big things. Like, that's over. Now you're just waiting. When's he going to retire? Is it going to be after this year? Is it going to be after next year? So there's a window where you can get in there and, you know, you can uh, – Start picking at the carcass, so to speak. You think so? He's got a Heisman he's contending getting, quarterback, <laughs> potential number one pick at, at quarterback. No, I'm, this I'm, year. I'm, like, not ta- I'm not talking about how I'm not talking about fifteen. Or... I'm not talking about how good they're going to be on the football field. Okay, this year, like uh, I'm, I'm talking about like towards the end of like it's like when Virginia Tech football recruiting was going bad behind the scenes. We didn't realize it, but it was because we were still winning ten games, right? Gotcha. Uh, so, like, there's like Carolina's recruiting ranking so far this year is down. They're normally signing a bunch of four star recruits. They've only got one right now. Um, they're he's getting negative recruited a lot because everybody knows he's going to retire in the next couple of years. Like, if you sign with UNC right now, you know he's not going to be your coach throughout your entire four or five years there, unless something. I mean, at least for UNC's sake, he better not be. Um, Does that matter as much? Today, sounds like though? Jim Beheim's situation. Uh, I'm not it's sure. like these players sign. It's like they're not going to be there for four or five years. <sighs> like, I, I know. Like, co- oh no, my coach left. Well, I can just up and leave and go wherever I want. I, I don't I, even I, need to get somebody's approval or sit a year out anymore. Will and I know someone who is uh, in like the administration side of things. He's not currently, but he's very close to a lot of people at North Carolina and the upper levels. And that is currently happening to them and hurting them a lot on the recruiting trail, according to them. Like opposing coaches still use that. Uh, and losing Dre Bly on top of that. Well, Dre Bly, yeah, that, right, right. I can see that. So it's all these factor. things together happening at the same time where there's an opening in the state of North Carolina where you can have success. Well, I want to ask you guys briefly your thoughts on how this 2024 freshman class is shaping up. I know we're kind of looking way ahead, but uh, if we just go through the names real quick, you got Davey Belfort was actually the first to commit quarterback uh tyler mason a running back joshua clark an athlete tommy ricard offensive line emmett laws he was kind of one of the bigger ones a defensive lineman uh derek dandy an edge rusher quentin reddish the most recent one at safety all of them are three stars uh ricard committed in late may before that it was april so you kind of had a gap Beltfort was the first like i mentioned in early march just kind of your thoughts on how these seven guys are shaping up and what else they will kind of look to attack and add as they go along in this uh, in this freshman class. Well, they'll look to add almost everything. Uh, whether or not they want to take a second quarterback is, is up in the air. Kind of depends on who's available and everything like that. But uh, right now, every position is open. You don't need to take as many wide receivers or as many defensive backs as you did because you went heavy on those positions last year. You need to take multiple defensive tackles this year. Because Tech didn't sign any last year. Yeah. And they've got three seniors this year. Uh, and we don't know about the guys behind them on the depth chart right now. So that's highly questionable. So I, you got to sign at least three defensive tackles in this class and probably hit the portal for a couple of defensive tackles after the season as well. So that's going to be the heaviest emph- emphasis, I think, from uh, from here on out. Are they going to win some battles? Are they going to win and like beat some some – you know, teams out there for highly sought after guys. Uh, last year, I want to say the top guy in state was 15th or something like that. Something like Somewhere that. Somewhere in yeah. that range. I think it was Cotman ended up being the highest ranked guy in yeah. state. Uh, you know, they just haven't won a lot of battles for top 10 stuff. Now, last year, they were behind the eight ball because they get here and, you know, Pry comes in and four of the top 10 are already committed to Penn State. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, I'm a little, a little behind on this whole thing, but they've had a full year to develop relationships with people and start to talk to some. Now, I'm, I'm not saying they're all the way caught up 
because this recruitment starts early in a high school career and sometimes even before that uh, with some of the super prospects. But, you know, they got to win some battles and prove that they can be a staff that can beat out some teams for some of these talented guys because, you know, if your whole roster is three-star guys, like, you can be okay if you develop guys, but you need some star power too, and you need to get some of those difference makers uh, you know, that can change a program, change the fortunes of a program. Who's that linebacker at Salem? Uh, Chris Cole. Chris Cole. Almost uh, the greatest name of all time. Yeah. <laughs> Three letters shot <laughs> of the greatest name of all time, says Chris Coleman. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about Phil Amazian here, uh, the former defensive coordinator at Virginia Tech, and I've spoken to him, and he watched some film of Chris Cole before he was the number one guy in the state. And – uh, he's he's like I'm telling you that guy is a difference maker. Even compared him, you know, if if he's like if Tech can land him, he could have a Cornell Brown type influence on this program. And you know, Phil was here when Cornell Brown came into the program, and he saw that firsthand the kind of difference that that kind of superstar, that kind of guy that carries himself like that, can make on a program. So I'm not saying that Tech is going to win the battle for him. But they need players like him that can sort of change things uh, within the program, the identity of the program. I think that would help accelerate this rebuild quite a bit. And I believe Chris Cole is taking his official visit this weekend to Blacksburg, this coming weekend. So that, that'll be big uh, for them. And I will say this, and I know what I'm about to say is going to be somewhat controversial. The relationship factor is very, very, very important, but the previous staff got criticized for their lack of relationships across the state the state right but the day justin fuente got fired virginia tech had commitments from three of the top 10 players in the state of virginia so it's not all about relationships right um and now there's an uh, and now they can't now they can't get a look at a sniff at them right well now there's another factor with the nil correct uh, factor in this whole thing so it's it's not just you have to make a good pitch, sales pitch and everything. Right. You have to have good relationships and you have to have a little financial backing exactly. behind it to make it happen, especially when you're going up against, you know, Alabama and Georgia for these top, top tier guys. I mean, mm-hmm. those collectives aren't going to mess around when it they're, comes they're to something not. like that. So, I mean, I know it's not supposed to influence recruiting, but let's all be honest, it does. Chris Cole has been, uh, he's a four star, like you were mentioning, has been offered by Georgia, Miami, Penn State, Notre Dame, Alabama. Pretty think, much everybody. I think he's already taken his official to Penn State, and after Tech, he's got Georgia and Miami scheduled. So that appears to be the competition. And we're going to sit back-to-back back defending national champs. Right, right. Yeah. And and they, they will, I'll flat out say it. Like, if they really want Chris Cole, that the, the fact that you technically can't give, you know, use that NIL stuff as a recruitment factor that's not going to be that's not going to matter to those schools so virginia tech has to be ready to counter that i think they've done a great job recruiting him it's junior day this past year back in january for a basketball game i had heard of chris cole but i didn't realize he was going to be this highly regarded i think tech was his first offer at this point maybe his only offer at this point they had a bunch of highly touted guys from around the state at the basketball game, and I look up in the crowd, and which one is Brent Pry sitting next to the entire game? It's Chris Cole. That should have given everybody a clue that early about how much this staff wanted Chris Cole. The staff has done everything right, everything right. They've they've out recruited everybody. They were first to offer him. They were the first to realize his talents. Um, they've done. A, a, he's visited at least five times, probably six or seven times. I mean, you couldn't do a better job recruiting somebody than this staff has done um t- you know tech uh tech has had some situations in the past though where they did a great job uh re- recruiting players and and then they go up against sec teams at the very end and you know sec stuff happens sec stuff will happen with chris cole it's a guarantee virginia tech has to be ready to counter and I'll just leave it at that. How many times do you think Brent Pride has brought up Micah Parsons in his conversations <laughs> yeah. with Chris yeah, Cole? Like is, it, to, yeah. is it every other word that he speaks <laughs> to him? Actually, I have a really funny story about that. So we, um, playing on the women's cross team, we kind of had a bit of a rust patch beginning of the season this past year. And um, Kristen Skyra, head coach, um, she called Brent Pry to come to practice and kind of talk to us and give his motivational speech. And you know him, he can talk forever. He's awesome. But I think he was out there with us for like 15, 20 minutes. And I think we were all like, how many times did he say Micah Parsons? His main story he let off with was like, 
I trained this kid. He was on my team, like Micah Parsons. Don't know if you guys have heard of him, but it was so funny. He just kept talking about him. And I was like, hey, great guy to be like, you know, give an example of. No, no knocks to him at all. But it was really funny. You guys just said that. I was like, wow, it must be like a thing that he talks about Micah Parsons. You because, play uh, the hits. Yeah. Like, he's not stupid. He's not going to play the deep tracks here. You play the hits. <laughs> and the right. guy that's yeah. like one of the most visible defensive players in the NFL right now, I'd be like, yeah, I coached him at Penn State. We did a pretty good job with him. Look, we could do that with you here, too. That's a pretty good pitch. That's, yeah. It's a great pitch. For sure. No doubt about it. Um, all right, Andy, I want to I want to bring up your your interview with with Mr. Phil Almation. Um, you know, it was a great interview, great article to read. If you don't get a chance, uh, go ahead and, and read it, um, but also listen to us talk about it a little bit too. Um, a little bit of background on him, former defensive coordinator at Virginia Tech. Um, early on in Frank Beamer's tenure before Bud Foster, kind of noted as laying that foundation for the successes that, that Tech had after, uh, was here for the start of the bowl streak and, and everything like that. So first and foremost, what was it like to uh, interview him? I saw that we had a profanity warning at the beginning. Yeah, he is an old school type coach. Uh, first of all, I, I didn't realize this until I started doing some research on him because everybody knows, or not everybody knows, but he's most known around here for being the defensive coordinator when the bull streak started kind of, you know, being the kick in the pants that this program needed at that point. But he was on Bill Dooley's staff uh, in 86 and 87 yep. or 85, 86 for those last two years, 85, Frank's, 86, Frank's first year was yep. 87. So he was there uh, two years, 85, 86. And uh, you know, <clears throat> they did pretty well when he was there then. And he remembers them walking in, you know, we, he, he comes here because he came from Minnesota. He was working for Lou Holtz at Minnesota and everybody knew Lou Holtz was going to go to Notre Dame eventually. I mean, Lou had it in his contract and everything like that. So the way he's figuring, he's like, yeah, Bill Dooley down here is the athletic director. He just gave himself a 10 year contract. He's got seven years left on this. This is a secure place to go. It's what's what could go wrong in this situation. And he gets to the third game of his second year here. And Bill Dooley comes in and goes, I'm no longer the head coach at Virginia tech. And he turns his, to another assistant next to him. He's like, are we fired? And that was the end that, you know, they finished out that season, but that was the end of his stint here. So he always, you know, he played at Ferrum down the road. So he always sort of had a soft spot for Southwest Virginia, but he, he felt that sting a little bit when he came here, but I didn't realize he had that first stint before the second stint that he had here. But uh, interviewing him is interesting because he talks just like he's on the sideline and he's a football coach. He doesn't hold anything back. Uh, you know, we didn't have to put the profanity warning on the thing. It was all salty language, but it was, that's just how he talks. That's just the way he talks. It, he's sort of like this, sort of a vuncular figure like just this uh he's sort of like an ed asner type he comes across that way like i'm trying to describe him uh to people but he's just like that's the way he talks he's just a fast talking guy he gives his opinion he doesn't hold back and uh you look at his career and he bounced around everywhere in his career i think it was 22 stops in 41 years yeah it's crazy uh he coached for like five Hall of Famers, I think it was. I mean, it's George Welsh, Frank Beamer, Barry Alvarez, Lou Holtz, uh, Nick Saban, Joe Tiller was oh, part of that group. Yeah. Uh, was it Hank Norton at Ferrum, the, the yep. famed Ferrum coach? That's, That's right. where he got his start. Paul Pasqualoni. Uh, Paul Pasqualoni. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I really mean, good coach. The list really goes coach. on and on and on of coaches he's been with. So he's got stories for days. He, it, uh, I'm writing a story now, the second part of this whole thing, about how he thought he had Lawrence Taylor coming to Richmond when he was at Richmond. He's like, I, I knew that guy was going to be great. And like North Carolina caught wind with it. It was over. And he was, he was going to North Carolina. He was not going to get him to Richmond anymore but uh he's just got stories and stories for days and i was first of all i talked to him for two and a half hours <laughs> this is one of the longest interviews i've done and he it, i had to ask very few questions throughout that whole thing because he would just keep going and he'd have stories for days uh but usually when somebody talks that much about the past you have to go back and there's a little small inaccuracies in it and they'll kind of conflate these two uh, events into one thing his recall of events that happened 40 years ago and the weeks that they happened and the matchups that they happened, spot on. Wow. Like spot on. He's talking about, you know, that uh, 86 season when, when uh, Dooley told them that he was no longer the head coach. He's like, you know, we got our butts kicked in the first game. 
Uh, I forget who he said it was against. And he's like, then we went down to Clemson and just beat the crap out of them down there. Then we just like, we kicked their butt down there. He didn't say butt. He used a little more forceful language there. And then he's like, then we're preparing to go up to play Syracuse. And I look at the schedule and every game is correct in the order of when it happened, when Dooley made the announcement and everything. And I'm like, this is incredible. Because wow. he's not sitting here going off notes throughout this whole thing. He just remembers this stuff. So he's got a memory like that and a uh, very interesting guy to talk to. I found it interesting when you talked about in there that um, there were a couple of things that, you know, I wanted to ask you about in particular. But first and foremost, why leave proven Syracuse? They were coming off a Fiesta Bowl appearance for a rebuild. And when he came back to Virginia Tech the second time around, uh, it, they were 2-8-1. and one. At that point, like why, and he why took a make pay cut. that switch? He took a, he pay took a cut. slight pay cut. Dave Brain, he had known Dave Brain for a while, and they'd both been in Virginia circles for a while. Uh, and he knew the kind of coach that he was. And his message to Elmo was bring discipline back into this program. And he knew he could do that. Uh, so I, I think Elmation was a little bit on the fence about it. It was an opportunity to be a defensive coordinator. I think he was a position coach at Syracuse, if I remember correctly from his bio. Uh, but Brain also guaranteed him a two-year contract coming back here. And I think uh, he just had, like I said, he had a soft spot for Southwest Virginia. Uh, he's like, Virginia Tech is a big ferrum. I knew the type of kids that they could get here. Uh, you know, how they could succeed here, what you had to do to recruit Virginia. He'd been in Virginia. He coached at Richmond, William & Mary, Ferrum. He'd been all over the state prior to this. Virginia was a stop before he went to Syracuse as well. So, uh, you know, he got the set of steak knives for coaching at pretty much every school within the state at that point. So I think he, he just liked the area, wanted to come back. Uh, he knew what the program needed. He came down here and he was the, you know, yell at everybody <laughs> type of situations. The famous, famous Billy Height quote is Elmo treated everybody the same, like crap. Uh, didn't say like crap, use a little bit more forceful language in that thing, but that's what he was. He was just this, you know, heat seeking missile coming in. And if people didn't like it, he didn't really care because he knew that's what the program needed. And he came in drill sergeant. Like he ran the players through hell at practice. He, he tried, he told a story about, how he tried to run off Jeff Holland, basically, uh, during one scrimmage and Holland played like a hundred snaps, never came out. He was still beating the guard on like the hundredth snap. And in Elmation turned to Todd Grantham, who was the defensive tackles coach at the time. He's like, we got one. We got a guy that hates to lose. And this guy like proved to them that they could be here. And that's what they need to find on that defense was a bunch of guys uh, that could be like that. And then they add Cornell Brown, uh, you know, they start having, sort of an attitude on defense again and guys that hated losing and they got this thing turned around. And he, he said that's sort of a counterbalance to what, what Frank was like as Good a head cop, coach, because yeah, you know, Frank was, uh, you know, everybody's buddy and you know, a very <laughs> loyal guy. And uh, you know, Elm Asian can play the bad cop on this. He had come from Virginia previously where he said that George Welsh was the most negative coach all the time. He's like, wow, we're going to bleep and lose all the time. And he's like, I got to be happy Jack. I got to be the, the positive guy for the first time in my life. <laughs> and then he comes here and, you know, he realizes that Frank is a very loyal and very, you know, humble guy. And he, he thought that, you know, maybe some of the players were taking advantage of that. You know, they knew what he was like and he wasn't going to, you know, jump down their throats about them. Elmo had no problem doing that. And he came in and, you know, those coaches, they they kicked those players asses for a while and it got them in the shape and, and that became a very good p football program. I have three, three notes about Elmashin. When Beamer wrote his book in, in 2000 after Virginia Tech made the Sugar Bowl one unbeaten that year, um, he, he dedicated a whole chapter to him and entitled it the most important hire I ever made. And it was about that hire, uh, which is really interesting because of the way Elmashen tells the story, it's almost like Dave Brain hired him. It's like Dave Brain did the negotiating. Dave Brain was a former coach, right, Will? Like, yes, Dave Brain was the athletic director at the time. He was a former college football coach who knew a bunch of other coaches. So it just kind of seems like Brain identified what was wrong with the program and knew the exact coach and went to Frank and said, this is who we, this is what you, I think you need. And this is who I think you should probably hire. Yeah. I think Frank, Frank was the ultimate decider there. Correct. I think Dave made a strong recommendation, yes. uh, having known him and, you know, you know, Dave looked at the program from 10,000 feet and decided Frank was the right guy, but mm -hmm. he wasn't getting enough help from his assistants. Right. Uh, so, you know, I, it was never like 
dictated to Frank that he had to make changes, but he understood. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. And um, I, I think I still think that book, if you want to understand, if you want to gain perspective on the program, where it came from, everybody should read that book. You should probably read the book. I probably in, fact, in fact, I'll give it to you. I'll let you borrow it before you leave here. Sounds and good. Uh, if you're going to continue as podcast host, you should read the book. But uh, <laughs> Also, one of my best friends played for Elmo when he was at Tech. Not, not just was a defensive player. He was, you know, under, he was a rover. So he would play directly under Elmo. And when, I, when uh, we got the chance to meet Elmo that day, um, the next time I saw my buddy, which I, was either probably that, probably later that night, I said, hey, guess who I met? And, I, and he said, who? And I said, Phil Elmash. And he goes, bleep that guy. You know, like he, he likes him. He recognizes uh, the, his importance in turn around the program and knows that was exactly what Virginia Tech needed. But he was like, but he was such a brutal coach that he didn't really want to talk about him. Well, the uh, <laughs> after I did the interview, I think I talked to him in April sometime, something like that, maybe it was late March, uh, I ran into Frank in the, the building, in the football building over there, and we were chatting. I'm like, you know who I talked to the other day? It was Phil Amazian. And Frank sort of gave a, like a whoo. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was reminiscing about Elmo, and he's like, yeah, he was always in a crisis and if there wasn't a crisis, he would create one. And I, you know, I asked Elmasian about that because uh, because Frank had said that before. So I, I had asked Elmasian about that during the interview, and he's like, "Yeah, that's a Lou Holtz thing. It's like always have be in a crisis and create a crisis and create these circumstances. They're going to test players' metal, and you're not testing their manhood and things like that. You're testing." You know, whether they can handle that kind of stressful situation because you're going to encounter that kind of stuff during the course of a football season or during the course of a game. And you have to be able to, to sort of weather that storm. So, uh, you know, I think you hear about him and you go, this guy just bounced around. He, he couldn't hold a job anywhere. And he's just sort of a hothead and stuff. It's like there was there was a method behind that whole thing. And, you know, sometimes that's what these programs needed. And, you know, you wear out your welcome pretty quick when that happens and and. Elmo said that pretty much. He's like, you know, I think I wore out my welcome at, at Virginia Tech. That's why he moved on to Washington after a couple of years. But uh, that can be very effective for a football coach, too. And and I think you need that on, on some of these teams sometimes. Definitely. Like, so spring of 1993, um, after one of those brutal spring practices, one of Virginia Tech's best defensive players, a guy who was a guaranteed starter, he just couldn't take it anymore and he left. Walked off the practice field, never came back. Right. So tech got worse from a talent standpoint because one of their best players walked off the field, but they went from two wins to nine wins because the overall team was more disciplined and tougher and everything like that. I mean, we saw Duke this past year. They didn't win a single ACC game the year before. They only won three overall games. They lost their two best offensive players. One caught over 80 passes. The other rushed for 1200 yards. So they lost their two best offensive players off a three win team. And then the next year they win nine games and are so much better. There was just more discipline, more toughness, uh, I, you know, and I think Cutcliffe on the whole did a great job there, but that program had run out of gas by the end. So I, th I think that new staff brought some spark in there that they greatly needed. And, and sometimes you don't know how talented, how much talent you have until your players are whipped into shape and display the right spirit and everything like that. I would have guessed that Duke had no talent when I watched him play in 2021. Apparently they did have talent. You just didn't know it, and you could see it this past season. So sometimes all it takes is a spark, and a guy like Elmo, Elmo can serve as one of those sparks, and he did for Virginia Tech. All right. Well, that was fun. Let's go ahead and completely flip script here. Last uh, topic of conversation today. We're calling a party down in Charlotte. <laughs> Men's basketball and women's basketball are set to play in Charlotte. The women will play on Thursday, November 9th. The men will play on Friday, November 10th. That is Veterans Day weekend. Men's basketball plays against South Carolina on Friday. That's a doubleheader with UVA and Florida. So that'll be pretty cool. That's on Veterans Day. How about this one? This is the real headliner. Women's basketball just announced this morning. It's going to play Iowa on Thursday. We get our Georgia Amor versus Caitlin Clark that a lot of people wanted to see in the national championship. And I think more than anything, this shows that Virginia Tech on the women's side is respected on a national scale now to, to make that kind of a matchup. 
I think so. And and obviously, this is the type of matchup that I think is important if you want to grow the sport of women's basketball. Have these big, you know, non-conference battles between two teams that were in the Final Four uh, the, the year before. These are games that people are going to watch. It's got star power in them. And so I think it's an important game, you know, not just for Virginia Tech, but for, you know, women's basketball in general. It certainly will be one of the most premier non-conference matchups, if not the most premier non-conference matchups. From a Virginia Tech perspective, it's a lot of Virginia Tech people in Charlotte. I Half my friends that I've known in Blacksburg or went to school with have moved to Charlotte. Um, so uh, two nights in a row, if, if you're a Virginia Tech fan living in that area, that was going to be great. And a lot of people will probably go down for it. I know Absolutely. probably everybody on this set might go. Well, yeah, are, party in my house, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Your parents probably would not be happy to hear that <laughs> if they're watching. This is what you want to see from your know, programs are going to be potentially top five going into the season. You see that on the men's side all the time with – you know, Duke goes to wherever to play some game against Kentucky or something like that. It's like this is what you you want to test your team early in the season, see what you have because, you know, it's not going to matter for making the tournament. Both these teams are going to make the tournament and probably be a pretty high seed uh, going into it. But you want to see what you have on your team and see if uh, you know test them early like that. A non-conference game, it's fine. It doesn't matter in the long run whether you win or lose this one, but certainly you want to win it. But if you don't, maybe you find some some weaknesses in your team that don't normally get exposed during a non-conference slate when you're playing all the directional state schools or whatever they are that they, they line up to play. So, uh, yeah, I think it's win-win. I think it's just a, a fun game and uh, a game that everybody's going to enjoy watching. Yeah, it's like a bonus. Like, if you win, that's icing on the cake, and it's an extra quality win. For your for your resume maybe you're a one seed maybe that bumps you from the two to a one but even if you lose it you're going to learn a lot about your team you're going to the tournament either way so yeah like you said it's a win-win how about the men's side play south carolina they have not played south carolina very much and that double header with florida and uva that'll be a nice little those are kind of those this isn't a full-blown like thanksgiving holiday tournament but it's one of those settings you always enjoy events where there's multiple fan bases in the house yeah i think and uh you know uva's obviously got a great basketball fan base uh we'll see if south carolina fans uh show up they have not been so great in men's basketball recently but it's a very very quick trip for them um i don't i don't know if they have a home game for football on saturday or not. virginia tech is at boston college that right. week for football so it's not like your people, tech fans are going to be saying, oh, well, I, I was going to go to the basketball events, but i got to go to Blacksburg for the football game, though. Virginia Tech is on the road this weekend. Which works place out where beautifully. Very few people are going to go Believe me, nobody is going to Boston <laughs> right. College. Like well, you know, Boston she's College like fans freezing. aren't going to Boston College. It's, it's going to be cold freezing. and rainy. No, thank yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be pleasant. 38 and downpour. And nothing ever good to Virgin, happens to Virginia Tech in Boston, no matter the sport. So... True, true. <laughs> Conti of, Forum is just as bad to us. Yeah. I was kind of reading into the South Carolina game earlier. I think the South Carolina coach, well, Mike Young, obviously, we know is at Wofford. Um, and so, obviously, Wofford being in Spartansburg, South Carolina, pretty close. Obviously, them playing a school like South Carolina, a bigger, bigger school at that point. Um, I know there was some sort of connection between the South Carolina coach and Mike Young. So, mm-hmm. I think that was also another big reason as to why that selection went in. So, Maybe kind of a cool rematch. Yeah, and I think uh, Mike Young is very popular in the Charlotte area, from yes. what I understand. Yes, it's very popular. So I, I guess just, this was the perfect episode for me to come this, on. This, all this is the <laughs> Charlotte episode. Yeah, all the Charlotte, all the Charlotte stuff. <laughs> what, what, what is this episode going to be called? Episode. This is two ninety nine of the podcast, so it's got to be called. I don't know. Will's probably already named it, but but since Queen uh, City something, Queen yeah. City special, Queen City special. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Well, that wrapped that wrap things up. Is uh, that it? That's, yeah, all, we got? that's okay. all we got. Unless anybody's got anything else they want to add. Uh, South Carolina hosts Vanderbilt football that weekend. South Carolina does have a home game that weekend. But at the same time, that's a really quick trip for South Carolina fans. So, Hour and a half. So who cares? Exactly. Hokies uh-huh. are going to invade. That's what that yeah. means. Because yeah. you got the, the women's game the night before. You stay an extra night. Right. And, you know, I think that works out. And I, honestly, I think people are going to be more, believe it or not, in tune to that women's game. Oh, it's, I mean, it's a higher profile. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. 100%. You know, honestly, which is fantastic. I don't think before what probably before this past year you could have said that. Uh, and I think the whole the whole thing's going to be great. That that area of Charlotte is, is great. I've there's never so, been. Oh, there's so Looking many different. There's so many things to, to do around there. They've done a great <laughs> job building building the downtown area. 
Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you once again to our sponsors today. Of course, the Hokie Way. Uh, of course, our brand new sponsor uh, in Alumni Hall and the First Bank and Trust Company. We got something special up our sleeve for episode 300. Will is going on vacation uh, all the way to Europe, but when he comes back, we're going to do episode 300 and we're going to kind of take a historic dive into uh, the Tech Sideline podcast. But for now, for Kendall Williams, for Will Stewart, Andy Bitter, Chris Coleman, I'm Giovanni Heater saying so long, and we'll see you next time on the Tech Sideline Podcast.